We're very fortunate this evening to have a fellow beekeeper and a friend of the Shenfields, Dr. Ken Foster. Just learning, I, I've known Ken for many, many years uh, out of the Ag Econ Department at Purdue University, but didn't realize he grew up in Jasper County. He's got a brother that farms over in Huntington County, so he's a northern Indiana guy. And uh, so I'm going to go through his introduction and then turn it over to Ken uh, for his uh, discussion tonight. Ken is a professor of agriculture economics and interim head of the Department of Food Science at Purdue. Professor Foster's research interests focus on the structure and performance of ag production and marketing systems. His research and outreach activities have included testimony to the United States Senate committees as well as the state legislative study committees here in Indiana on the competitiveness of the livestock markets and the use of contract production. His work has influenced the decisions of private stakeholders in the livestock and meat industry. And probably most notable, he's been a co-author on a couple of books, Positioning Your Pork Operation for the 21st Century, which was a uh, provided guidance to the international pork industry during a time of dramatic technological and market evolution. And then he recently co-edited a book, How to Feed the World, that addresses many of the major challenges to, sustain to, to sustainably feed a growing global population. Professor Foster teaches agricultural price analysis and is in Purdue's book of great teachers. He has experience working in Latin America, Australia, China, Europe, and Africa. He said he graduated from Purdue in 1981, and those of you that were around at that time know that ag maybe not was in the best of shape in 1981, so he left the country. Um, came back in 84, and he said it really wasn't that much better. Uh, times are much better today. So I, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Foster. He is a part-time farmer. I think, Ken, you said you have, what, 40 to 60 beehives. And he produces honey, just like Shenfields do. And he's a third-generation beekeeping and honey business operator. So Dr. Ken Foster, welcome tonight. Thank you, Howard. I appreciate that uh, great introduction. And um, just thanks to all of you for having me here. Um, it's kind of fun to take this off and speak to a group of, uh, oh, what did I do? Mess it up already? <laughs> so that the IT people are for um, to save my bacon. So uh, you probably know that uh, we've gone through an interesting time here of COVID. It's uh, really refreshing, like I said, to be in front of a group of people again um, and particularly without wearing a mask because down at Purdue we teach but we keep our mask on um, and how many of you have a son a daughter a brother a sister a cousin a nephew a niece or something of the other sort at Purdue right now anybody raise your hands high and be really proud keep your hands up how many of you uh, went to Purdue even if you didn't graduate Okay, that's, that, that just about fills the room. Um, so you can look across the country um, over the past year and the challenges of education in general, but universities in particular, and it's pretty hard to find a place that did it as well and successfully as Purdue. And um, honestly, uh, being there, I can tell you firsthand that most of the credit goes to the students. So if you do uh, have a student in your family or uh, in your circle of friends who's at Purdue, then uh, tell them that you're proud of them, please, because they need to hear that. It hasn't been easy for them. Um, and they have done an incredible job of making what I hope are a set of unique um, memories for themselves over the past year um, and keeping each other, keeping their instructors and keeping the Lafayette community, frankly, safe. So give them a hand of applause, even though they're not here. Just, I, I, I honestly just can't say enough, um, enough about that. Um, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to come here and talk to you. Um, uh, Howard gave a great introduction. Um, they asked me to come here and talk a little bit about sustainability in the food and agricultural sector. Um, that's a big topic. Um, he said, keep it high elevation. That's good because otherwise we might be there all week. Um, and, and then you might wonder, well, why this guy? 
of all the people at Purdue whose names you read about in the news all the time that talk about things that might be related to sustainability. Um, Howard mentioned this book, uh, really a book that was driven by uh, this grand challenge facing people engaged in producing food of feeding potentially as many as 10 billion people sometime in the next 30 years. Now, it's unlikely we'll get all the way to 10 billion, but we're gonna have a lot more mouths to feed. Um, and it's complicated. Um, and it involves a lot of different things. And so we started out this process because if you pay attention at all, if you have a social media account of any sort, you know that there are a ton of voices speaking in various languages, and I don't mean like foreign languages, I mean from different perspectives, um, different passions, um, some accurate, some less accurate, um, and there's just a lot of noise, but very few of them speak from a point of expertise uh, and from a point of view of science, and so we set out to write this book to tap into the expertise at Purdue and the scientific knowledge at Purdue, and my co-editor really deserves a lot of the credit, Jessica Eyes, um, for making this happen because she comes from a completely non-agricultural background. She landed at Purdue um, and she started to discover all of the science that falsified many of the things that she had been led to believe. And so she challenged us to write the science, but write it in a way that people could understand it and in a way that people could engage with. So I'm not encouraging you to buy this book. I, it, I'll tell you that if I make a few pennies from this book, I donate it back to Purdue. So if you do buy it, it's not to make me rich. I'm not pushing the book. I'm just, um, it was a great project. It was fun to do. I'm excited about it. Um, we've got it, uh, it as a part of the World Food Prize Youth Institute. So kids all over the country are reading this book and we're having a chance to engage with them and talk to them about um, what it means to feed a growing world population sustainably, or at least more sustainably. And then when I heard about this uh, opportunity to speak here and they said that they were gonna be honoring the Shenfield family, um, that was an opportunity I just couldn't pass to congratulate them, Dave and, and and to your dad, um, grand old great father of all beekeepers in Indiana, honestly. Um, and that picture on the lower right, that's my dad, who passed away a few years ago um, at the ripe old age of 100. He kept bees actively until the age of 88, and he never really stopped paying attention to what we were doing and telling us we were doing it wrong uh, until the day he died. Um, <laughs> But he was a good friend of, of Don Senefield's. They started out in the beekeeping business about the same time, and I think they um, provided a lot of insight and help and um, ribbed each other every chance they got about uh, the mistakes that each other made. So uh, it's just an honor to be here and be a part of this from me from a personal perspective. So let's talk a little bit about sustainability. I pose this question, what, what is sustainability? I can tell you right off the bat, don't bother with the dictionary because it won't help you with respect to sustainable food and agriculture. Um, and I can tell you that it doesn't help to ask anyone because you'll get a different answer from everybody. All of us come at it from our own perspectives. And I'll tell you too that I don't have a definition and I'm not here to push on you a definition. What I would like to do is talk just a little bit about um, the things that I think are wrapped up in what it means to be sustainable in the context of food and agriculture. Um, and, and to that end, um, I put up these pictures. Uh, and you can see one of them is a picture of the way we farmed when I was a kid. We turned everything over upside down uh, and we know today that that's not good for the soil health. We know that we release a lot of carbon, we lose organic matter, um, we affect um, things that we aren't even able to see with respect to the soil. We talk a lot these days about soil health. And we talk a lot about uh, microbiomes and what that means. Um, and then I put this picture 
Uh, Howard made mention of 1981, I graduated from Purdue and I left the country and I spent three years working in Central America with farmers, some beekeepers and some others. Um, and this was not an uncommon sight, someone farming with a stick. And in some parts of the world today, that's still the case. And I guess what I would posit here is that neither one of those appears very sustainable to me. Um, well, that's not a definition of sustainability either um, in any sense that I can think of. And I could stand here and I can continue to talk and I can be the, the voice of something. Um, but it reminds me of the old farmer that decided to go back to college. Um, and he showed up at Purdue and the first class was math. And as we all know, for some of us, math is a struggle. And he sat down in the classroom and the professor stood up before the class and he says, no, because some of you probably are feeling pretty dumb today. So, you know, if you feel that way, stand up. If you feel dumb, stand up. And there was a long pause and nobody stood up. And finally, the old farmer looked around, he stood up. And the professor said, oh, fine. You're feeling you know, a little intimidated and, and not too smart today? And the farmer said, well, not really. He goes, I'm just feeling uncomfortable seeing you stand up there alone. <laughs> So, so, so what I want to do is I want to create an opportunity for not just me to potentially say something stupid. So, so what do you think, somebody out there, what do you think is an important dimension of sustainability in food and agriculture? You can't say anything dumb, that's the, that's the punchline. What do you think, anybody? Yes, sir. Preserve the health of the land. Okay, soil health. Okay, productivity, preserve productivity, excellent. Anything else? That's it? This is easy. Yes? Producing more and more food with less and less land. Okay, so, so being more efficient, right? Okay, maybe reducing the environmental impact in the process. So maybe environment is a part of this? Yes? Innovation. Innovation. Explain what you mean by that. Um, that now I'm going to feel dumb. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I think it's you know that that constant pursuit to try to figure out how do you do things better, how do you use less okay. resources to be able to do it and make it produce more. So is that a goal or is that a means to a goal? Both. Okay, we'll come back to it. Anything else? Being able to farm in the future and. Okay, is, is that a cultural desire, a societal desire, a personal desire, an economic? All of those. All of those, so economic sustainability is important. Cultural or social or community stability is important. Family stability maybe is important. Is that, I mean, am I capturing what you're saying? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Anything else? You said more than I thought. Yeah. yeah. You see? You're not dumb at all. Yes, sir. With biofuels, we see them displacing oil or carbon out of the ground. Okay. So, so again, potentially environmental consequences. Yeah. Okay. Yes, sir. Protecting the uh, natural order of things, like insect population and other indigenous animals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Biodiversity, I think is the word that the smart people use. Right? <laughs> Others? Water quality is not important. Okay. Water quality. Environment. It's, again, it's a part of environment. Yep. Anything else? I kind of hinted at it earlier. One thing that's in my mind. How about secure source of food? A secure source of healthy, nutritious food. A secure source of healthy, nutritious, safe food. Is that a part of sustainability in your mind? Shake your head yes. That's what Dr. Postaway used to say in biology back in the day. Right? I don't know what he would have done if we had ever shaken our head no. Um, might have just thrown everything off course. Right, so, so wow. that that. That's a load, right? So this is why I say it's really hard to define 
sustainability in the context of food and agriculture because it's multi-dimensional. And worse than that, these things don't always go together well. And that's what makes the problem complicated. I mean, we can solve this environmental problem, just stop farming. Right? All the insects and the biodiversity, it'll all come back, the plants, the animals, everything's fine. But what happened to this economic, social, cultural, food security part? I know those are extremes, but this is what economists study, right? Trade-offs, right? And that's the challenge uh, that we face in the context of defining sustainability is um, how do these things trade off between each other? How do we find the sweet trade-offs, right? The ones that give us more bang for the buck, such that what we're willing to give up a little bit of one of these things to get a lot of another one. Innovation, if you want, getting more from less, right? It's finding those trade-offs that will help us not necessarily define sustainability, but achieve it, right, that are important. I want to make sure I don't forget anything. My students tease me because they say, you write everything down, and you look at your paper, and I go, well, um, if it's on the paper, I don't have to remember it. It's like Einstein. He said, I don't need to know my phone number. I never call myself, <laughs> right? So... All right, so we've talked about those things. So this next slide, and, and Howard, if I go past my half hour, you give me the hook, but I'm, I think I'm pretty well um, versed at sticking to my time because when the bell rings, the students get up and take their backpacks and leave. Um, how do we get to um, this idea of sustainability? And so I put down three broad categories of things that I think matter and matter a lot in this context. And, Back to this idea of innovation, here's where I think it comes in. I don't know that innovation is the goal so much as it's the means to the goal. And we think about technology and knowledge, we're talking about things that potentially change those trade-offs that, um, that we were talking about, right? That it, how much can we give up of one thing to get a gain in one of these others? These things that are at tension with each other economic well-being of farmers and consumers versus the well-being of the environment or biodiversity. And can we change some of those things? I, I like to throw this idea out there um, for, the, for the people that do all this uh, gene editing and genetic modification. I would love to see a cactus plant that requires very little water that produces corn from a flower that feeds Dave Shenfield's bees um, and has roots that fix nitrogen like a bean, right? That would be a real game changer, wouldn't it? Um, now, I doubt that they can ever get there, but we all know that there are game-changing technologies being developed in agriculture. Um, I read recently about the, uh, uh, this um, viral therapy. You know, this is, this is the, the COVID vaccine, right? Um, the Johnson & Johnson one, they took a virus um, and, they, and they deactivate it and they slip the genes in there that make us immune to COVID and they stick it in us. Um, and these people are developing technologies like that for plants. You know, today when we drop a seed in the ground, we drop a particular <coughs> genetic code in the ground with that seed and it will, and it will grow according to that genetic code. But these geniuses are developing a way that if we see drought stress coming at flowering time, we might be able to fly over that field, spray it with this treatment, and delay flowering time until maybe the weather gets cooler or more amenable to flowering. Tremendous game changer in terms of dealing with climate change, dealing with uh, environmental consequences of agriculture, reducing the need for potentially pesticides and other, um, other things that may be harmful to the environment. So technology is potentially just a tremendous game changer um, in this whole game. 
And we talk about, you know, I, I put up there old, old things with new names. So, you know, the racy term today is regenerative agriculture. And when I ask somebody, what's regenerative agriculture? It has to do with soil health and maintaining productivity. And then they start talking about things like cover crops and minimum or no-till. And they start talking about uh, managing the soil microbiome. Right? So, look, cover crops are not new. Um, everybody's grandfather knew about cover crops, often used cover crops. Um, minimum tillage and no-till is not new. Um, it's still being adopted, but it's been around for decades. What we're starting to understand is how these things work in the context of the soil and in the context of this thing that we call now the soil microbiome, this relationship between the microorganisms that live in the soil and the plants that grow with them in the soil. Hey, we got it too. I've, they, they mentioned I've been working in food science. There's a whole bunch of people over there who are busy studying how what you eat affects what lives in your digestive system and how that may or may not lead to or reduce the likelihood of a whole bunch of health consequences. Everything from irritable bowel syndrome to colon cancer to digestive disorders to, believe it or not, your mental attitude. This one shocked me that they actually have a connection between what's living in your gut and how you feel about yourself and, the, and, and your surroundings. And the more we understand those interactions, the better we will become at managing them to reduce the consequences of food production or produce it more efficiently. The, the foresters have known for years that a mixed stand of trees, different species, performs better than a monoculture of trees. What they understand today is that these trees actually share nutrients with each other through the fungal network in the soil. So when one species of tree is stressed, they actually will borrow from nearby trees of another species. And this is why this, you know, the recommendation for decades has been don't plant only one type of tree plant a mixed species forest. So we're understanding things, we're gaining knowledge that helps us change the game and change the trade-offs that are such a pickle for us to solve in the context of sustainability. And then I put up here uh, new things to solve old problems. Um, and you know, we, we talked about spraying over the field uh, to change the, the genetic expression of everything from flowering time to crop height to uh, potentially many, many different gene expressions that could be affected by these new technologies that completely change that set of trade-offs that we thought we were faced with, that we thought we were constrained from making true gains in sustainability. This is why anytime somebody talks to me about one of these challenges, I say, just follow the science. Um, because these things have a solution. We have to be willing to, to look for it. Um, markets. You get an economist in a, in a room to speak to you, you know they're going to mention markets and how markets affect things. And so I put up here three things. Markets for things, markets for ideas, and markets for services. That last one might really um, intrigue you a little bit. Um, the first one, I, and I know this can be a little bit of a contentious um, example to use, and maybe that's why I use it, but plant-based meat. There's a, thing that, there's a thing that we keep hearing about. And I know, um, I know there are a lot of farmers who are irritated. There's no other way to put it. They're irritated by this. I had one call me up there. I, this is irritating me. Um, and, and and this particular one was a plant-based milk. And I'm like, look, don't tell me that you wouldn't buy a cow that, um, that you could change every day according to the prices, the, the, um, the milk components from that cow, and, um, and it didn't poop. And he goes, yeah, you're right, I'm a little bit grumpy. And I go, um, so, so, so there's that. Um, 
But there's also the reality that as much as we might fear the change and the challenge of plant-based meats to, um, to our way of life, there's always gonna be some challenge to our way of life. And preparing for it is the secret. Um, okay, what, what might happen with plant-based meats? One of my colleagues uh, actually did a survey recently, I just saw it yesterday, where he had uh, written something about it, where he polled farmers about what they thought the impact would be of a substantial increase in the demand for plant-based meat. Uh, I think he used 25% of the meat market as his threshold. And the majority of them said that farm incomes would decline. And I scratched my head about that. I said, I think this is gonna be far more dynamic than that, um, than that simple answer. Um, imagine, 25% of the meat market, somebody's telling us something if that happens. The, the people that make these plant-based meats, they call these consumers, their target audience, flexitarians, um, because they're flexible with respect to their consumption. They want plant-based meat some of the time, not all of the time, and they want it to taste and feel like meat. They're not vegetarians. Vegetarians don't want that. I can tell you, vegetarians don't like plant-based meat because it tastes like meat. Um, so, if we have that kind of increase, let's recognize that the type of plant protein that goes into plant-based meat is not the type of plant protein that we produce today here in Wabash County. Um, it's not the same, necessarily, the same plants, and it's certainly not the same quality that you will pass through an extruder and sell directly to a consumer that you would pass through an animal and turn into meat and then sell the meat to the consumer. Right? Those are two very different food products. And so there should be opportunities for farmers to produce these, likely at higher margins than they get today from things like corn and soybean because of the specialization of those, of those crops. Okay, great. The farmers with good farmland in the right places um, might be no worse off. What about people like me who own lousy farmland? What happens to us? Well, I don't think the meat industry goes to sleep. Right? If they see 25% of their market share um, disappearing to people who are concerned about things like environmental consequences of real or perceived, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to preach plant-based meat for or against, real or conceived, uh, perceived um, environmental benefits, doesn't matter, right? If the consumer perceives it and they spend their money for it, it's real in the economy. Well, the meat industry will surely respond with more extensive production systems, more pasture-raised meat, right? And that will help the effect on marginal land. This is my, this is my image of where things are going. Who's harmed? Not everybody gets off of this scot-free. Um, certainly people that are producing um, intensive livestock are probably going to be harmed by this, right? There's no avoiding it. And so I think the important thing for farmers is to watch these markets, watch the evolution of markets for things, and assess them, is there an opportunity for me in this? Or is there a threat for me in this? And if there's an opportunity, how do I capitalize? If it's a threat, how do I adapt, right? And I'm not saying that some farms won't suffer if plant-based meat becomes 25%. I'm saying I don't think it has to be as scary as we treat it right now, okay? But there will be other things. There will be demand for other things. There will be markets for other things that can be produced that will lead to real or perceived sustainability benefits. Okay? And, and it's certainly true that it takes a lot less plant protein to make a pound of plant-based meat than it takes to make a pound of real meat. And to this story of getting more from less, that 
in essence, is what we're talking about, getting more human protein from less inputs, right? So, so it's not gonna go away. It's not clear that it's gonna get any bigger or how big it's gonna get, but it, but it will not go away. Um, markets for ideas, um, you know, I've been doing a little bit of uh, nosing around in this idea of blockchain, um, which probably doesn't mean anything to anybody unless they trade bitcoins. Um, but blockchain is essentially a set of digital ledgers that track something across different um, segments of a chain of custody. Right? So a farmer produces something, it is certified for some particular attributes, they hand it off to uh, a, a shipper or a transportation entity, and then they hand it off to a processor, and then they hand it off to a retailer, and eventually it gets to a consumer. And this idea is that no longer are we guessing at the quality, no longer are we passing off paper to each other, but we are building this into an electronic um, digital transference that is not hackable. Um, and you might think, well, that doesn't really uh, affect me. But it could if you start to produce things with more and more specific attributes. Right? In other words, if the market for things that have sustainability attributes evolves for agriculture, and you want to participate in that under some sort of smart contract, then you sure want to be able to prove your quality through that supply chain because otherwise when it gets to the end somebody might say well it's not the quality that we ordered under the contract we're not going to pay you but if we have a set of electronic devices that are monitoring quality recording that quality into a digital record that is unhackable then when it gets to the final point it's indisputable whether or not it meets the, cert the, the certification standards. The other thing is it just takes a lot of time to pass off paper trails, especially in long supply chains like we have now across countries. So Merck, um, the big international shipping giant, has estimated that for perishable products, for many perishable products that they ship over seas and air, the cost of maintaining the paper provenance of that product is as high as the cost of the physical shipping. That's outrageous in a day when we carry around a supercomputer in our pocket. Right? Now I sign documents with my telephone. And, and so, so there's a tremendous opportunity here for a market for an idea. I mean, it's really hard to like say blockchain is a thing. Um, but they're just incredible opportunities to save money, make things more economically sustainable. It may not have any impact on the environment, but it could have a tremendous impact on people's bottom line. And services. This is the one that everybody's asking about now. Howard even made reference to it. This idea of markets for carbon. Markets for carbon sequestration markets for carbon offsets. There are people paying for these today. We saw just a couple of weeks ago that Microsoft is working with Land O'Lakes to pay farmers to offset their carbon footprint. I talked last week to a young man in Indianapolis. He's pushing the state legislature to create space for carbon markets, carbon offset markets, and he is actively working with companies that want to claim carbon neutrality, but they can't eliminate all of their own carbon um, emissions to pay farmers to adopt technologies and activities on the farm that would reduce and offset their own carbon emissions. So that they can do what? Claim to their <coughs> customers, we're carbon neutral or we're carbon negative. Now, I have lots of problems with this. You heard Howard say, uh, at the outset in the introduction that I spent a little time early in my career um, with people in the Senate Ag Committee in Washington and people in study committees in Indianapolis looking at lot contract livestock. And to me, this feels a lot like being a new 
professor at Purdue in 1990, pushed off into the deep end of the pool and told, go talk to farmers and other people about contract livestock production. And they were not very open to that conversation at that time, I can tell you. Um, and they had good reason not to be. The contracts were terrible. They were hideous. Farmers got paid for things they had no control over. <coughs> when a pig died, you lost money. The pig didn't die because I did anything. It died because it was sick when I got it. They were paid for feed efficiency, and they didn't get to pick the feed ration. All they did was make sure the feed got to the pigs. And today, if you go around Indiana, a lot of the contracts today aren't like that anymore. They pay farmers based on um, square footage of space. Oh, my favorite one, they got paid by the number of pigs that got sold. If the owner of the pigs decided they wanted to raise them out to you know, 10 or 15 pounds more, what that mean for the contract grower? Less money, right? Now, fortunately, we had farmers here in Indiana who knew pig production, and they were smart enough to figure some of this out on their own. But I had many calls of people um, asking me about a contract, and I would point out some problem I thought, and then, and then the next question was, if you've already signed one of these, is there a way to get out of it? And um, so I, I worry that we're in a little bit of a period of wild west here with respect to carbon markets. Um, we don't really understand them. Um, they're not standardized. Um, I worry about a variety of things. And I have a couple of my young colleagues at Purdue that I've been nudging into the deep end of the pool on this issue. And so I think we could spend days talking about this. And I hope someday that Purdue Ag Econ will be out and about talking um, with farmers and talking with policymakers about this about this topic, and the last thing I have here is policies, um, and then I'll and then I'll probably shut up. I won't say too much more about bees because we've talked about those. Um, in order for us to create lasting policies around anything related to sustainability, all of those things that we enumerated at the very beginning, we have to find some shared values in that some we have to find the things that we can agree upon um, that this is a problem and this is something that we're willing to enact long-term policies on okay president biden can sign a bunch of executive orders related to what was it how our climate change environment and now food security he's just made the fifth pillar of usda's strategic plan those would be as good um, as long as President Biden's in office and then they'll be gone. Um, now, we are, we are pretty clear just from reading the news and listening to the news that, that these things are important to him, climate change, environment, and food security. So we can expect more um, policy proposals around that. The question to me is what form will they take? Um, Will they be command and control? We're gonna cut off these activities that create greenhouse gases or we're going to cap the amount of greenhouse gas emissions in an industry? Are they gonna take something that's more incentive-based? Here's a payment in exchange for doing something that adds to these goals. Or here's a tax for not doing that. Um, or are they gonna take a more market-based approach, right? which would be what? Which would be this kind of quasi self-regulated, market-driven, carbon offset payments type model. I would bet at least initially on that, on that one for a couple of reasons. One, it doesn't cost the government any money to encourage and support the development of markets for carbon offsets. Two, they don't have to pass any laws, so we don't have to worry about whether we all agree on it or not. Um, if the consumer is willing to pay Microsoft for, for um, a zero carbon footprint, it will happen, right? It will happen by itself, and I think that's going to be the initial bet um, that they'll make around, at least around a lot of greenhouse gas related things that would come back to affect agriculture. 
I don't anticipate caps on agricultural emissions. I don't anticipate um, taxes, carbon taxes coming out of uh, the Biden administration, at least not initially. Now, if the other angle doesn't work, um, and particularly if they get a second term, then I think you might expect more draconian policies like taxes on carbon emissions. But initially, I think we're going to find this, can the market do this on its own? Is the will of the consumer there to make this happen? So just, uh, I, di I did have a slide about bees, but, but Dave stole my thunder when he said a third of all of our food um, comes from honeybees. And, you know, you can read that. There's just a tremendous amount of things going on that depend on pollinators all over the world. Um, you know, I, I, like, um, I, like, I like this one, that 71 of the 100 crop varieties that provide 90% of the world's food depend on pollinators in some way or another. That doesn't mean that if we didn't have them, 100% of that food would go away, but the quality of it would decline, and the amount of food that we have, especially in some very food insecure parts of the world, would be, would be damaged. And then let's not forget that they're a little bit of a canary in the coal mine for us. When we see pollinators declining, um, it probably has implications for all of us. Um, and so, so just keep that in mind. Um, I'm going to skip this last slide because it doesn't really tell us much anyway. But uh, I'll stop there. And, and Howard, I don't know if there's time for me to take a question. I'd be happy to if there is. Questions? Yes, ma'am. The honeybee population and the pollinators a little more seriously than like what they've done in European countries? Um, well, Dave might disagree with me. Um, I'm not going to say that neonicotoids are not a problem. I think it's I think it's been improved with the switch from the talc coatings of seeds to to the hard paint on coating. I don't see I don't know about you, Dave, but I don't see as many bees dying on a hot, dusty spring planting day as I used to. Um, when the, you know, that, those planters blow that dust up in the air, it's got the talc with the, it, it laps over and it settles on the dandelions where the bees are going and they carry it back. And, and if you go look at your beehives, there'll be bees lying on their back bicycling with their, with their feet. Um, I don't see as much of that anymore. Um, uh, I would also say that in this country, um, and certainly in this state, corn rules. I think most of us that keep honeybees understand that you know corn is a more significant economic contributor to Indiana than, than honey. And so we go out of our ways to try and keep our honeybees away from danger um, as much as we can. So you won't see very many beehives um, parked along the edge of a cornfield, for example. We try to keep them close to rivers and streams and highway right-of-ways and lakes and whatever else, you know, might harbor them and keep them a little separated from that. Uh, so I, I, I don't hear a lot of talk around those anymore. I don't know, Dave, I don't know if you have a different perspective on neonicotoids than I do or not. I got my perspective. Okay. <laughs> what about uh, from every farmer I talk to, they say that it's not even a problem that worm in Indiana here, except for maybe like one county, but they're even targeting the neonicotinoids. Yeah, um, I, I, I'm not an expert in this, so I have to be really careful. I have read um, some of the things that my colleagues in the entomology department have, have written. Um, so I'll, I'll say two takeaways from, from what I've seen them write. Uh, it's not just the dust in the air at planting time that's a problem. It's the fact that this stuff um, is transferred through the pollen of the corn as well. Um, I'm not sure that they have investigated that side of things in the soybean. I'd actually be more worried about it if it was in soybean nectar than, than corn pollen. But the other, um, the other piece is that the folks in the entomology department at Purdue uh, concluded that really for soybeans the seed coating is not necessary. Um, corn, corn in some places it, it may be in some places, but for soybeans it's not really necessary at all. 
Um, that, and again, that's just me paraphrasing their research. I'm, I'm not an entomologist, so it's not, not my area. Yes, sir. Corn syrup, sugar is bad, Americans are drinking less soda, more water. Uh, you know, what's out there to for new markets for corn or for new crops that farmers could grow if we have, you know, these mega dynamics that are at play at macro level of corn market? Um, well, I would say, I'll, I'll say two things and probably at least one of them from a point of ignorance. Um, I think this emphasizes the importance of of trade, international trade, because there are places in the world that that do still demand Indiana's corn. Um, we're not exporting as much corn as we once did, partly because of trade policy, but also because we have stronger local demand for our corn here with ethanol. Um, but that just means that corn somewhere else is being exported and not putting pressure on Indiana's market. Um, the other thing I would say is that, you know, with these threats, um, uh, you know, look, uh, Indiana farmers invited ethanol into their communities um, to create demand for, uh, for their product. Um, we may find ourselves inviting plant-based meat factories and things like that into our communities to create demand for crops. It might not be corn. Uh, it might be some specialized variety of peas. Um, or something else, but but that would be one just one possibility, right? Thank you, Ken. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yes, you did. You stole my stuff. <laughs> so I need to recognize our silver sponsors tonight. Our silver sponsors are Crossroads Bank, First Farmers Bank and Trust, First Merchants Bank, The Paper of Wabash County, the Regional Chamber of Northeast Indiana, and Thorne Insurance. So let's uh, thank our silver sponsors. <laughs> then our bronze sponsors this evening we have AgVenture McKillop Seeds, Pippa State Bank, CFC Distributors, Eads and Son Bulldozing, InGuard Insurance, Jessica Parrott, Indiana Farm Bureau Insurance, Mosher's Tarps, My Honey's Honey, Ray Logan and Company, LLC, Senator Andy Zay, the Town of North Manchester, Visit Wabash County, and then Wabash Valley Abstract of Inc. of Wabash. So let's thank all of our bronze sponsors. So the moment we all came for tonight is to recognize Grow Wabash County's Farm Family of the Year. This is our 11th Farm Family of the Year and another one of our exceptional farm families here in Wabash County. We just feel it's important to recognize one of our producers, not that anybody's the best farmer, some think they are, but we want to recognize somebody who does it right. And they do it right from an environmental standpoint, they do it right from an economic standpoint, and they really make a contribution to feeding the world. And we certainly have that tonight. So I would like to introduce or invite Keith Gillenwater, president of Rural Wabash County, to come up and help present our Farm Family of the Year Award. Keith. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Keith Gillenweather. I'm the president and CEO of Girl Wabash County. Um, before I get started, I would like to say thank you to Howard Halderman, to the committee who for the last 11 years have worked their tails off to put this event together and really salute agriculture in our community. So if we could, please give a round of applause again to all of those committee members and Girl Wabash County staff who make this all possible. On behalf of Grow, on, Grow Wabash County, it's our pleasure to recognize the Shenfield family and Clover Blossom Honey as the 2020 Wabash County Farm Family of the Year. 
think we have a video, don't we, Keith? We do have a video uh, that we'll show before the family comes up. Thanks. And just so you know, you may not hear a lot from Dave tonight, but we spent an hour and a half out at Clover Blossom Hunting. That was just a couple weeks ago. That doesn't include the, the time. You, you watch this video and you'll say, yeah, you didn't shoot that in February. And you're exactly <laughs> right. We didn't. So this, this takes a lot of effort. And again, thank you to The Paper and Joe and, and Don for putting all this together for us. honoring our farm family at the end of this year, Dave Shenfield and Clover Blossom Honey. With over 3,000 hives, Clover Blossom Honey has helped to pollinate all over Indiana. They even send almost 2,000 hives every year to California to pollinate the almond crop there. More and more we're learning how important bees are to our agriculture, to our food production. It's incredible that there's still some families out there that are passionate about this. The Shenfield family especially, every part of this family, has a hand in this business. Well, I guess I've always been interested in genetics, but I started this in 1959 as a hobby. A friend of mine bought a bunch of bees over Coca Bowl and he didn't have money to pay for them, so he asked me if I'd buy half of them. That was a mistake. <laughs> <laughs> then I had to go to three or four big outfits around and wanted to sell me bees, so I gradually got to the point after 10 years or two of two jobs and four hours sleep. I either had to make up my mind to work. But I was a tool maker, so I had a good job. But uh, I decided to either going to have to do this or that. And if I was going to use my energies to build a business, I'd just go well build my own and send somebody else. Well, when I started it, we produced big crops of honey. And that was basically our income. But, uh, it's gradually changed now. Back in then, they thought pollination, we all do it for nothing. But now it's gotten to the point now where if you're not in pollination, you can't make a living out of it. You've got to like it. It's a different job. Uh, you, you've got to really like bees. In fact, this honeybee sting has got to be less than a clock sting when you're going to affect it. That's the actual mistake. A honeybee stay five minutes is gone, but that factory clock hits there. <laughs> I'm Howard Holderman, and I chair the Agriculture Committee for Grow Wabash County. This year, we are recognizing the Shenfield family and Clover Blossom Honey as our farm family of the year. Each year, our committee selects a producer in Wabash County that we believe represents two main key features when we think about agriculture and that industry as it is in the United States today. One, do they have a global impact across the entire world, not just Wabash County, not just Indiana, but across the world. And Shenfield certainly meet that standard. Believe it or not, their bees not only pollinate crops here in Wabash County, they pollinate a number of crops across northern Indiana, and in the wintertime, they are shipping their bees out to California to pollinate an almond crop much of which is exported to foreign countries all over the world. So certainly they have a global impact on the agricultural industry. Secondly, we look for a producer in the county that does agriculture the right way. Now what do I mean by the right way? Somebody who is conservation minded and environmentally friendly in their production practices. There is nothing more environmentally friendly and sustainable than beekeeping. Bees are a foundation element of agriculture production today. Without bees, we wouldn't have vegetables, we wouldn't have fruits, and we wouldn't have any flowers that we enjoy in our gardens. And so the Shenfield's purpose in producing honey is twofold. It not only is to produce that sweet little product that we love, but it also enhances all the other crops that we enjoy and that we feed to livestock and ship abroad from right here in Wabash County. So again, on behalf of the Agriculture Committee of Grow Wabash County, we are very honored to recognize the Shenfield family as our Farm Family of the Year. Well, we run, uh, we run about 3,000 hives. Uh, 
2,000 or so of those being on my Court House, moving throughout the uh, throughout the Northeast Indiana for yeah. sort of locations, a little bit of pollination here and there, and also for California in the, uh, in the winter time. Um, probably have about 160 or 70 locations throughout Northeast Indiana where we place the hives for honey production. Uh, most of that Wabash, Huntington, Grant, Blackbird, Wells County, Allen County, Kosciuszko County, and a few others. Um, have about uh, seven or so people usually run during the peak season. A couple more in the fall for uh, extracting the honey. We have actually five full-time employees that work year-round, and we have one guy that part-time has been here for a long time, and then extracting season is when we hire a couple of extra people, and that's usually just through August, September, October time frame. Always put everything needs to be done in May preferably, depending on the weather. The weather plays with everything intensely in the beekeeping operation. So you try to get August plus, then usually start at the end of April, if the weather's fit, to go through May. Barely into June, you can get your honey supers on start about then, and then hopefully have all your bees made up before June. And then honey supers on through then June, July, and then maybe a little bit more first of August, but preferably not. And then you start pulling it off as well if it's dry. Then you go through extracting season, pulling the honey off. That's August, September, end of October, hopefully done before November. You get all that done, and then you have to get your bees prepped for California until winter. So you do that in October and November. Hopefully, have all those bees going to California by Thanksgiving. And then we try to get our bees to stay here, fed, and ready for winter. And then uh, go through that, and then in December we'll fly up to uh, work the bees in California. And then we'll, after that we'll fly back here, we be here some more, we'll fly back to California in January. Finish out there at the beginning of February, come here, and then have to feed these bees again here. And then that'll go through the March, and the bees come back from California at the end of March, and then you restart the whole process again. So a honey super is an additional box we place on the hive. The hive is usually Two of the deep boxes that we maintain throughout the year, and the honey supers will go on top of that. And that's just some more room for the bees to go up into and put the nectar once they've collected it. So we just place additional honey supers as we see fit, and as they're filling the ones below it, we'll add it over on top and we'll keep going up. Ideally, we can get four or five honey supers on the hive throughout the year. That's the best case scenario. And usually we're averaging closer to two supers. We get still every year. So my dad is a tool dye maker at Dana, and he got tired of punching the time clock and doing everybody's work at the factory, so he decided he was going to go to business for himself. My great-grandfather had a couple of beehives in the orchard, and he messed with them, and then there were some guys at work, and he started filling with bees, so he started a hobby in 1959. And then he grew his hobby, and of course I was a kid, and as long as my feet were under his table, I'd do what he said, so I had to work beats. And I hated beats. I was never so glad to graduate high school so I could get away from the beats. So then I went off the Army and came back in 74 and started working with Dad and started building operations. He was running around 700 hives at that time, and we grew to 2,000 hives, and then more family got involved. My son Derek got out of the Navy, and so we had to have more bees, so we grew to 3,000 hives. And Derek thought, you know, we need 5,000 hives, but when he found out how much it takes to run 3,000, he decided 3,000 is a good number. Right? <laughs> the farm, actually, where the building is, here we got five acres. Um, so my dad purchased this ground out here in 1974. We started out with just the main main barn and then we've added on to that other barns but as far as the farm itself you know we have over 150 locations throughout northeast and southern indiana so our farm expands out basically three hours to the south two hours to the north and an hour to the east and west that's the ground we cover where the bees are as far as the business goes i just wanted to be able to sustain the, the people that are working here and our families and give everybody an opportunity to be a part of it but really my main goal in this whole business is is, is the honeybees i mean there are so many problems in, in bees today which back when dad started this 
you know, beans just live. I mean, 10% would be all you would ever lose, but, you know, since that time in the 80s with the parasites, the tracheomite, the bromite coming here in the 80s, it's hard to keep bees alive. So I've worked and I've mentored and, and we work with genetics and we work with Purdue University and other universities trying to come up with bees that will live in today's environment. And so that's what really my goal is. It's not so much for the business anymore. That's their plan. I is just to try to help honeybees, you know, thrive and, and, and sustainability of bees in, in the United States. I mean, it's an honor um, to be chosen as that, to be recognized that, you know, you've kind of done something that was worthwhile, but uh, to me, you know, I've been a part of organizations, presidents, directors, uh, I've been a, a part of a lot of different things, and now I just want to be a beaky, you know. It's an honor to be chosen but it's not really necessary for me at this point in time. I mean, farm family of the year, that's, that's kind of a big deal. I mean, for beekeepers, you know, we're kind of the, the stepchild of the agricultural community. You know, nobody knows what beekeeper does. Nobody, you know, I mean, a lot of people appreciate it, but it's just a small part of the agricultural community. To be recognized as that, I mean, it's, it means a lot to family, for sure, and, and the beekeeping industry as a whole, really. I mean, we provide a very big and important service the community and to the country and the agriculture as a whole, you know. Uh, pollination alone is a huge, along with the honey production, you know. The United States has a huge demand for honey and the United States beekeepers can only produce so much. And so for more of them to get a little bit of knowledge to that, you know, that's, that means a lot. Farm family of year, uh, I know a lot of families have got it and, and all well deserving, so it's quite an honor to to be recognized, like I said, considering this got started in the 50s. So it's uh, been a long time coming, guys. <laughs> Steve and Lisa, would you like to join us up here? I'd like to have Steve and Lisa Flagg join me. No. Uh, up here on the stage to recognize the Shenfield family. Steve and Lisa were our 2019 Farm, Flame, <coughs> Farm Family of the Year. So Dave, Derek, Beth, if you guys would like to join us up here. Thank everybody, all my beekeeping friends and everybody that came, but I wanted to talk about my dad. I know no Ralph Dahl's probably come tonight because he thought Don would be here. Now, Don is doing fine. He's 90. He still cuts his own firewood. And it was kind of funny before we started all this, because before the interview they said, uh, is your dad going to be in the picture? I said, I don't know. You have to ask him. Is he going to answer some questions for us? I said, I don't know. You have to ask him. Because I wasn't going to. So, but he's doing real good, and he's still active in the business skills. He'll come to the shop and tell Derek, uh, you don't know what the heck you're doing. <laughs> so he's still active. Thank you. Okay, on behalf of uh, Lisa, uh, Black, and myself, we'd like to walk the Grove Wabash County. We'd like to congratulate you. Congratulate you. Congratulate you. What an awesome honor. Thank you very much. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Chelsea, we've got a really nice award for him that is packaged. <laughs> <laughs> have. Final thing you got to earn it for. Yeah.
So the, uh, I had in my notes that uh, we would give them a DVD, and obviously I'm behind the times. I think they'll get a link and they'll be able to download this <laughs> video. Uh, so however you guys want to use the video, we also, uh, we award them with the sign that's back here behind Keith, and you guys can hang that there in the shop or in the, wherever you want at this point. So again, congratulations. Did you guys want to add anything to that? Or? I just want to justify why I look so tired in that video. <laughs> <laughs> These guys have been to California working bees, where it was warm and nice. I've been here where it's cold, prepared for tax time. So there you go. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. <laughs> One more thing, so I just I just got my second COVID shot today, so I'm a little goofy, but you know, I didn't know what dad was going to do, okay? So I'm talking to my sister Beth here, I said, uh, you know, what are we going to do with dad? Well, you know, he could have come out. He finally told me today, he's got to go to the doctor in a couple weeks, and he ain't going to the doctor until he gets his COVID shot. So I guess we're going to sign him up. <laughs> Congratulations once again. Uh, we have door prizes, as we always do. We'll get a picture here after a bit. Okay. I'll wrap up in like two minutes. So at your tables, everybody has a centerpiece. Uh, wooden, ivy, boutique, and floral produce those for us. And if you have the program in front of you with the gold star, hopefully you kept your programs handy. If you have the gold star on the back of it, you're the winner of that centerpiece. All right, we have a winner. So there are stars out there. Chelsea said there were. Also, the gift baskets that we gave out to Dr. Foster and to the Shinnefield family uh, are provided this evening by Visit Wabash County. So we thank uh, that office for that. Yes, and then Beth is pointing out, at all of your tables, there's these little teddy bears and honey. And that is the very sweet clover blossom honey. And I have learned both from Dave and from Dr. Foster that Indiana honey is the best in the world. My dad asked based on what ranking, and Dr. Foster said, hits. <laughs> there you go. So as we close this evening, I do want to recognize all the businesses of Wabash, and specifically our agriculture industry. Thank you, Steve and Lisa, for coming tonight, and the Shinnefield family, congratulations. A reminder, all of our sponsors, we have our diamond sponsor, Beacon Ag Group. We have our gold sponsors, Advanced Ag Resources, Series Solutions, City of Wabash, Holderman's, Horizon Bank, Farm Credit Services of Mid-America, Louis Dreyfus Company, Poet Bio Refining, Wabash County Farm Bureau, Wild Flower Ridge Honey. Silver sponsors were Crossroads, Crossroads Bank, First Farmers Bank and Trust, First Merchants Bank, The Paper of Wabash County, and the Regional Chamber of Northeast Indiana, as well as Thorn Insurance. And then our bronze sponsors, and we have a tremendous number of bronze sponsors this year, AgVenture McKillop Seeds, Fippa State Bank, CFC Distributors, Eads and Sun Bulldozing, InGuard Insurance, Jessica Parrott with the Indiana Farm Bureau Insurance, Mosher's Tarts, My Honey's Honey, Ray Logan and Company, Senator Andy Zay, the Town of North Manchester, Visit Wabash County with their gift baskets, and Wabash Valley Abstract of uh, Wabash. So again, thank you for your support of Rural Wabash County, and thank you for the support of the agriculture industry here in our county. Congratulations again to the Shinnefield family. If anybody is interested in talking to us about the 2021 award for Farm Family of the Year, we're always open for nominations. So with that, have a safe trip home, and best wishes uh, for a great planting season here in a month or so.